Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the common ion effect and kind of how it relates to equilibrium. And so we need to remind ourselves of uh, Le Chatelier's principle. To my students, I always describe Le Chatelier's principle as the Jurassic Park principle because it's that great line that nature finds a way, right? So that you mess with equilibrium and it will figure out a way to balance itself out by shifting the reaction and response and then creating a new equilibrium. So if we have um, ions that are in solution, then those ions in solution are going to impact the equilibrium, and they do that by messing with the, either the rate of the forward reaction or the rate of the reverse reaction. And depending on what's on either side of those reactions, it's going to impact the acidity and basicity of the solution. So that's really what common ion effect is all about, and this leads into topics like buffering systems, for example. But we have to talk a little bit about the concept first, and then we'll talk about how we can create systems and utilize this information to create solutions that can then buffer from large uh, swings in pH, which is what a buffering solution is. All right, so the acidity and basicity of the solution can be impacted by the ions present from side reactions. Now, a side reaction is something that happens kind of not necessarily unintentionally, but there are multiple things that are going on all the time when you interact um, different chemical components together. So the molecules are interacting with each other. Um, the you know collision theory tells us that things are colliding all of the time, and this can cause secondary reactions or side reactions to occur. Um, that are going to impact the overall system. And so if the system is in equilibrium, let's take this weak acid, um, this hydrogen cyanide here, when I put it in water, because it's an acid and it's a weak acid, it'll give you a little bit of hydronium and a little bit of cyanide. So if we were to say, well, what happens when I add this solid compound, sodium cyanide? Well, if I add sodium cyanide to water, it's an ionic compound, and based on what I know about the solubility of sodium, which is when it's paired with anything, then it's going to be soluble. Then what I really have is this kind of equilibrium. And you'll note that I don't have water in here, but it's sort of implied. So I could kind of put water in here as a condition because um, everything here is aqueous. This thing is going to be soluble. And when it's soluble, it really splits into its component pieces. So I add this solid to water. Now it's sodium cyanide in solution. But what's really happening is I have sodium ions and cyanide ions. So if I think about what that would do to this equilibrium, so I have a reaction flask with this going on. It's at equilibrium. It's slightly acidic. I add this solid to it, what I've essentially functionally done is increase the concentration of my cyanide ion. And from Le Chatelier's principle, we know that if I increase the concentration of a product, that's going to shift to the reaction towards my reactants. So it shifts left. All right, so that's kind of how we've answered questions before in terms of Le Chatelier's principle. So it shifts towards the reactants, which means I have less of this in solution. So what does that mean then about the ionization of my hydrogen cyanide? So as a compound, do I get more ionization or less ionization? Well, if it's shifting towards the reactants, then I have more of this in solution. So that means I have less uh, um, ionization. Ionization just means, you know, splitting into its component ions. You've probably heard the term dissociation before. Um, it's the same kind of idea. So we're ionizing HCN. We're going into our component pieces. Now, a kind of a follow-up to this then is, well, what happens with the ionization? Well, it decreases because I have more of this now in solution. But I could say, well, what does that do to the pH of this solution? And if it shifts towards the reactants, then I'm shifting away from hydronium, which means my solution is getting less acidic. Or if we're thinking about this um, in terms of pH, then it's an increase in my pH volume. And we can actually put some numbers to this. We're just kind of talking about this 
conceptually at this point. Now, degree of ionization is kind of important, um, and we can actually measure these types of things if we're thinking about it in terms of individual molecules. The degree of ionization, just by definition, is just the parts out of the whole. So it's the number of molecules that are ionized over the total number of molecules. So when I talk about the degree of ionization of an acid or the degree of ionization of a base, then that just gives me essentially a percentage because this is a ratio. This would give me some sort of decimal value I can multiply by 100 to give me a percentage. That gives me a general sense of how many of these things are splitting apart into its component pieces. Okay. All right, let's look at another example. Let's go to zinc hydroxide here. All right, so if we take solid zinc hydroxide, so zinc hydroxide is actually a weak base. The hydroxide here is going to dissociate. When it does dissolve in water, it's going to give you some hydroxide, which makes it basic, um, but it's not very basic. And actually, when we're talking about solids that dissolve in solution, uh, we can also talk about them in terms of a KSP. So the K just means that it's an equilibrium constant. The SP here means solubility product. And we'll play around with this idea in later videos when we're talking about solubility of, of solid compounds in more detail. But for right now, we're focusing on this one because it is a base. And so when we dissolve it into solution, we can talk about its solubility. And you can see that this number is quite low, right? This would also be its Kb value because that gives me information about this as a weak base and how much of this hydroxide in solution is going to be dependent on this value. Because this is so tiny, this is fairly insoluble. So it will act like a base, but it's not going to put a lot of hydroxide in solution, so that concentration is not going to be high, so the pH is not going to be too far on that end of the pH scale. So what happens to the solubility of this solid then if I add a base to it? And then the follow-up question to that is, what happens if I add an acid? So if I add a base like sodium hydroxide, we know that sodium hydroxide is a strong base. So I'm going to get into the habit here of, of writing most things in equilibrium because realistically everything is in equilibrium. It's just a matter of how large or small the magnitude of our equilibrium constant. So We'll just kind of get into the habit of writing everything in equilibrium, even though this is a strong base and we know that this dissociates essentially completely. So this Ka value for sodium hydroxide is going to be quite large. This is aqueous. Sorry that you can't see that. Okay, so functionally, how this impacts this equilibrium, again, thinking about Le Chatelier's principle, what is this going to do to mess with this system in equilibrium? Well, I'm essentially increasing the concentration of hydroxide by quite a bit because sodium hydroxide is a strong base. So I'm putting a lot of hydroxide in solution. What is that going to do to this equilibrium? Well, it's going to shift the reaction, as we saw in the former example as well, towards the products or sorry, towards the reactants, I pointed the right way and said the wrong thing. All right, so it shifts towards the reactants because I've increased the concentration of my products. And so now what does that mean about the pH? Well, ironically, and I sort of love this about these types of problems, when I add a strong base, functionally what that does to this system is make it less basic, right? So I added a strong base that increased my hydroxide concentration. That means this whole reaction is going to shift towards the reactants. I have zinc hydroxide that precipitates out and less hydroxide in solution. <laughs> so it's going to get less basic, which is kind of crazy. Now, depending on how much you add, if you add a ton of this, then the amount of the concentration of your hydroxide from this is going to cause the solution to be basic. And again, we can put numbers to both of these things, but right now we're just thinking about it conceptually.
Okay, you with me so far? Let's think about this in terms of an acid then. So if I add HCl, which we know is a strong acid, and I have HCl in solution, and again, we're going to get into the habit of thinking about everything in equilibrium, then really I have hydrogen in solution and chloride in solution, or we could think about this as hydronium in solution, right? So we could think about this in terms of H3O+. plus. That's what an aqueous solution of H plus is. So when I look at this and I say, well, what is this going to do to my original reaction up here, my zinc, then I don't see anything as readily in common as I did with the base, right? Before I said, well, uh, this hydroxide is in common, so that's an obvious mess with my equilibrium here. But this isn't as readily apparent because I don't have any chloride in this solution up here, so that doesn't really give me any information. But the hydrogen or the hydronium is really the key to this. The hydronium is going to react with this hydroxide. So by increasing the concentration of my hydronium or my hydrogen, that's going to decrease my concentration of hydroxide. And kind of why you say, well, it's because of this drive towards producing water. So the Kw value is so small on the ionization of water, that auto ionization that we talked about before, that the drive to form water is very strong. And so the hydrogen and the hydroxide, when they see each other in solution, are going to want to neutralize. They're going to want to form water. And so this is functionally going to remove hydroxide from this original equation. Okay, so by removing that hydroxide then, Le Chatelier's principle says if we have less product, then our equilibrium is going to shift towards the products to fill that hole. So it shifts here. So it's going to shift right towards the products. To fill that hole. So if we shift right, that means we're putting more hydroxide into solution. So what is that going to do to the pH? If I have more hydroxide in solution, that's going to make it more basic. And again, this is going to hurt your head a little bit because it's a little bit hard to get your brain around because I added a strong acid and I functionally made my solution more basic. Okay, so common ion effect can get a little bit wacky and it all comes down to um, thinking about it in terms of Le Chatelier's principle, thinking about it in terms of what happens when these ions are interacting with our system in equilibrium and kind of going from there. So we'll actually put some numbers to this in future videos, but this is kind of an introduction to the concept and I'll talk to you all again soon.